If you're feeling down and out and like you just can't make it in real estate, then this video is going to be a pivotal moment in your career where you're going to realize how much potential you truly have. This genuinely is a story you need to listen to. It's a little bit longer than some of my videos, but it's going to completely change your perspective of what you're capable of doing when you eliminate excuses and go all in. Today, I'm bringing on an incredibly special guest, Hervé Kiriati from Africa, who moved here with $1,200 to his his name went on to be a janitor while living in a living room then within a matter of months was leading a company and ended up leading 450 employees doing 16 people's jobs where he then quit in order to get into real estate to which he took his course within a matter of months and now one year later he's doing about eighty thousand dollars in commission per month. So what we're going to do is break down Hervé's incredible story and how he's leveraging Facebook, his personal profile to get 80% of his business and exactly what he's done in order to serve clients, carve out a niche and the one incredible switch he made with his open houses that went from him doing open houses every single weekend and getting no clients to making this one simple change that we're going to break down. And now he's closing deals every month month from clients that are coming from his open houses. So before we get into this, two quick things. Number one, I will link Hervé's incredible social media profiles below so that you can see exactly what we're talking about. And number two, if you resonate with this incredibly life-changing story, I'm going to link his calendar link below so that you can book a private one-on-one -on -one call to talk about parting with him and getting his support to build massive momentum as an agent. So without further ado, let's bring him on here. His incredible story and then what he did as a new agent to build extraordinary momentum within his very first year. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video where we've got on a very special guest today, Herbe, where we're going to be diving into his incredible journey as a new agent. It's one of the most powerful stories I've genuinely ever heard about a new agent coming from very humble beginnings and building mass momentum within his first year. So we're going to be diving into all tactical strategies, but just really excited to hear, you know, have you on here, man. I, I think this is going to be one that really resonates with a lot of people and, and impacts a lot of lives how you doing i'm doing good are you again man this is this is going to be fun it's it's been so incredible to to watch your journey from the beginning and and see what's happened over the last 12 months so i think you know let's start from the beginning of of your story because i think that's going to be something that really puts people into perspective as to what they can do and how anything is possible when you put your mind to it right yeah, so um, my name is Ari. I moved from DR Congo back in 2015, um, uh, I would say. So I moved to the US to basically um, chase my dreams. So, but my story really started back home. So in 2020, uh, 2010, I basically graduated from high school and uh, my parents wanted me to go to medical school, which I did. So I did uh, go to medical school for like one year. I did pretty good. So. Um, we were like 1,600 students in that first year, but only a handful of people could advance to the second year. And um, among the 35 that did advance, I was uh, one of them. But having that success in medical school was not really something I was uh, really wanting to pursue for my entire life. So I had to make it difficult, like the most difficult decision of my life to come home sit with my parents and then tell them I was actually um, dropping out of school. I made my mama cry that day. And uh, that day was <laughs> the most painful day of my life. But I knew deep down I had something better to offer, right? I just loved entrepreneurship because my dad, my mom, they did everything they could to raise us. I have nine siblings, right? So I came from a big family. My mom, she never worked. She had to take care of us. So I saw my dad like also like doing like everything it possibly could do to make sure we had what we needed. We never missed anything, by the way. So that spirit, that passion, that drive, I was like, damn, how if I could do what he did, but do it better at a bigger scale? I need to become like a bigger businessman. But back in my country, you have no, you have no chance basically, right? We are one of the most poor country in the world. So my only chance was really to get out of Africa, like get out of the country, to, to go somewhere else. So I was trying to find ways to get out of the country, 
But then I was like, what if I go to North America? And um, I think we have like a lot of opportunities out there, right? And I was like, okay, let me go to Toronto. That's my favorite destination. I'm going to go to Toronto. I'm going to um, start over and then become that bigger businessman. So that view of mine was kind of easy to, to imagine. But getting to Toronto was like, <laughs> was like close to impossible, right? So I went back to my parents. I told them, listen, I am going to go to America. I need to start over my life. And um, I just feel like my dad uh, telling me I have to be North America. Then my mom went like, how are you going to start? Who do you know in, in Toronto? I said, no one, but I just need to be there. So it took my dad about seven months to digest it. He never talked to me for seven months. He was so hurt because he invested so much in me. And for him, I was basically throwing out my future. After seven months, he called me into his office and then he told me, you are really throwing your future away. I said, dad, I love you, I respect you, but this is about me, right? My guts are telling me I have to go to North America. So at this moment, I truly need you to either support me or to not support me. But either way, I am going to Toronto. So he looked at me like I was crazy. And then he said, where do we start? I said, fine, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. So I started to do some research, how to get to Canada. I had to apply for a visa just to find out my country wasn't issuing Canada visa anymore at the time. So basically, I had to fly to another country to just basically um, go to the embassy and then start the process of getting a visa. So I ended up going to Kenya. Getting to Kenya, it was really hard. I couldn't speak any English. They don't speak French, which is my first language. I didn't know anyone. So I basically landed at the airport, not knowing exactly where to go. All I knew was I had an appointment the next day to the Canada embassy, right? So I just sat there at the airport watching people and then waiting for someone to come save me. An hour, two hours, three hours passed. Then I saw that lady speaking French. I was like, okay, I don't know this lady, but no matter what's going to happen here, she's going to take me with her. So I approached her, uh, we did talk, and then she was also from my hometown, visiting a son who was basically a preacher in, uh, in Nairobi. So she took me, um, she found me an hotel, she helped me exchange my US dollars today, um, shillings, currency. The next day I went to the embassy and then did my interview, never got a visa. So from 2011 to 2014, I got denied a visa about 10 times. So I had to try over and over and over and over again. And my parents, they had to spend money. I even saw my dad selling one of his houses to finance my crazy dream. Like the dream, only I could see, right? Yeah. No one else could see that dream. But they did believe in me. They did trust me. And uh, long story short, 2015, I ended up moving to, to the U.S., which was something I never planned, right? So I got to the U.S. Um, 2015, May 1st. I was here. I had no clue on where to start. I just knew I had to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know what to do or where to start. I didn't even have any money. My dad gave me 1200 bucks. So I got here and the very first day I had to pay rent, which was half of the money I had. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I was renting like, uh, like a living space, right? Sleeping in the living room. So sleeping in the living room is another beast because you have to be the first one to wake up every single day and the last one to go to bed. And that was really hard. So I had to find a job. I was like, okay, if I have to at least have a decent life, I need to find a job get myself another apartment like my, like my own apartment and then start to figure things out couldn't speak any english couldn't find any job and the only thing i could find was uh being a janitor at a catering company which was fine because at least i got something i was making like nine dollars an hour at a time working only 40 hours sometimes even less so i couldn't afford an apartment so i had to actually um find roommates like and people to, to help me out so we could stick together, find a place together, and then just uh, start life. So I worked in the company, and 
when I got to that company, I saw a future. I saw an opportunity that many people in the company didn't even uh, see. I saw people working in the company for like 10 years doing the exact same thing, 15 years doing the exact same thing. At that day, I was like, listen, in order for me to get to where I need to go, I need to stack up money. In order for me to stack up money, I need to make more money. And in order for me to make up more money, I need to move back in the company. I'm not going to be here like cleaning floors and taking trash every single day. So how could I go from this to running this entire company in less than five years? So the first thing was I had to learn English. So I put myself in school. Yes, had classes. I was working basically from one in the morning to four, sometimes 5 p.m. every single day. And then and, and going to school at 8 p.m., taking ESL classes, which was like uh, 90 minutes. Then I would go home, I would sleep. I didn't have a car in the beginning, so I had to wake up at midnight to catch the last bus to get me to my job at 1 a.m. So I did that for about uh, four, five months. Then I started to pick it up. I started to communicate. I was able to, um, to learn. But I had a job in the company, in my specific department, People didn't value me. I didn't even have my name in the freaking schedule. So I had to always ask my lead every day, am I working tomorrow? And then she'd be like, yeah. Or she'd be like, you off tomorrow, come the uh, day after. So it was kind of a struggle. And uh, I think it was because of my nationality that I came from. People did not just value me. They were like, okay, why do you have to offer? So I was like, okay, if they don't see the value in me, in this position, I have to force them to see it, I have to create something that they lack. So that way they cannot do anything else but believe in me and then embrace me as a part of the team. So I started to learn all the struggles they had in the department, all the issues, like every Monday morning, I would go to my supervisor's office and then ask him, what was your biggest challenge last week? And then he would tell me, then I'm gonna find ways that week to either fix it, learn it, or at least give him an idea on how to solve it, right? So I did that for about a month. And then he started to like me. He was like, oh, I like this kid. So I started doing it. Uh, I just started to help people in the department, asking people questions, whatever they are doing. Oh, okay, do you need any help? Can I carry a box for you? Can I, can I do this? And just building the relationship with the department to kind of get me, to get them not only like me, but show me the way, right? Show me how things are being done in the department. And um, I did that for about a year. Then one day my supervisor called me. He was like, them. Um, I have six called, call of sick. I said, okay, I'm coming. So we had crazy snow that winter. I catch the bus. I got to work around six in the morning. Six people call out sick. And then it was like, how do we do? I said, okay, let me try at least to do something. He said, do you even know how to do these positions? I said, I don't. But right now you have six people short. So either I do it wrong or I don't do it. But either way, it's not getting done. So what are your options? He said, okay, fine, try. So what he didn't know was for the past 12 months, I was basically studying every position in the department. I was observing, I was learning without even anyone teaching me. I was just waiting for the opportunity. I was like, okay, I need to get myself ready for when the opportunity comes. I did not want for the opportunity to come and then for me to start learning. So I did things backwards. So I learned every single position and um, I did the job. It took me like 13, 14 hours that day to complete everything, but at least I did it. So the next day, the manager came, her name is um, Jane. I will never forget her. She asked John, the supervisor, you had six people call us yesterday. How did you manage to, to get a job done? Then he was like, well, that kid um, did it. So she looked at John and she said, how in the world is he a janitor? He didn't have any answer. So she called me in the office and then she said, kid, what's going on with you why are you cleaning floors when you can basically do six people job i said i don't know you ask him so she looked at john and she said from now on this kid is your new lead so i went from cleaning the floor to basically leading the team 
the same day. So these people, when they came back to work the next day, John had to do like a shift briefing, right? To introduce me to the team as a new lead. And everyone was actually shocked. I mean, yeah. how can he even be a lead? He doesn't even know how to do this. He doesn't even know how to do that. But they did not know. We had 18 positions in the department. Each person could do one position, but I could do them all because I've learned every single position. So that's how I got started in the company. So I became a lead. Within six months, I got promoted to a supervisor position. Then I started managing a team of 35 people. Um, but my focus was really to finding problems and um, solving them because I knew that where my, my value was, right? If I could do that better than anyone, I would have an edge over everyone. So I just started to, um, to learn the issues, the challenges, and uh, building the team up, trying to just um, help my team to grow and then increase revenue. And within um, two years, I went from cleaning the floor to becoming an operation manager. And I was running basically four departments, which was 75% of the entire company. But That's when insane. I got, <laughs> yeah, so when I got to that position, um, basically that was my goal because when I started the company, I wanted to run the damn company. I just started to lose some kind of drive, passion, because I didn't have anything to climb up for anymore. So I got my goal, I reached my goal. So then what? I didn't want to become the general manager. Um, plus at the same time, my son was born in 2021, um, right? So I was like, I need to do um, things better. I need to make a change. That's why I started to be interested in real estate, but I never really wanted to um, to become an agent. My goal was, okay, I'm going to learn how to be an investor and start to, to invest you know, into real estate. But my drive with real estate and my love for real estate really came in 2019 when I purchased my first house. The process was good, but I didn't have any clue on what I was doing, right? I didn't have any idea on how to buy a house in the US, how things work, how credit score works, uh, what do you even need, right? How to search for home. Does the home have HOA? What does it even mean? Like all these things, I didn't have any clue. So I had to lean on my, my agent to trust him basically to make the right decisions on my behalf because I had no clue. Then when I was thinking about real estate in 2021, that got me back to 2019 to think about how the process was kind of like blurry for me. And I was like, okay, I was like, if it was this way for me, that means it's also this way for millions of people in this country, especially immigrants like us. Like in other countries, things are not like this. Real estate doesn't work like this, right? You buy a piece of land, you find some money, you build a house, that's it. There is no such thing as mortgage. There is no such thing as credit score. There is no such thing as down payment, right? All these things are okay. What if I can really get these people to understand the process from A to Z? Not to make them buy real estate, but to provide them value that would help them make the best decision when they come when the time comes. Right? I, I had a conversation with my wife. I was like, okay, it's gonna be better for you to get into real estate, to start taking um the classes because I have a, I already have a job and uh, it's taking me too much of my time. I had like excuses, right? Then she was like, okay, I'm interested. Then she started also um, learning about real estate, being interested into real estate. But then 2022 comes and um, there was something that happened at work. My son was kind of sick. And I texted my boss at four in the morning. I said, um, hey boss, uh, my son is sick. I won't be able to, to make it work. And that specific day, we had a lot of issues with Alaska Airlines. And I was the one, I mean, the go-to guy in the company. Whatever issue you have, you find me. You call me, you text me. I don't care if it's one in the morning. I don't care if it's Sunday. You call me, I'll be there for you. I never call out sick in seven, in seven years. And that specific day, I had to be there for my boy. And my boss texted me back by saying, there are days where I really need you here. And this is one of these days, right? I looked at my son, I looked at my wife. Um, I told my wife, I am going, right? I went to work. I did what I had to do. I never had a conversation with him about that. But 
deep down, I was like, I don't want to be treated this way, especially when it comes to my boy. And um, I love this company. I owe a lot to this company because I came from nothing to this. I was a kid when I came, now I'm a man. But I just feel like I need to do what I was called to do. I have to be an entrepreneur. I really have to dive into something else. I need my freedom. I need to be free. I need to decide when I wake up and when I go to bed. I need to decide exactly what I have to do in my days. Not air, like not anyone calling me at five in the morning when my son is sick to ask me to go to work, right? I started thinking about it. I started thinking about it. But the stress at work just started to become more and more and my drive started to decrease. And I got to a point where it was unfair for my employees because they wake up every single day to come work for me. I had four, uh, like 450 employees that woke up every single day to come work for me. And these people, we built a team to where, to a point where I could tell them we are going to hell, but they are going to enjoy the trip with me. So that's how loyal they were to me. And I was like, I don't want to give them 100% of myself. That's unfair. If I have to be the leader, I have to be at 120 every single day. And if I'm not able to give them 120 of myself every single day, I need to resign because they don't, they don't deserve this. They don't even know what happened with my boss or what the struggles I'm going with management or the issues. They don't even know that, right? They want to see me giving them 100% of myself, 120% of myself every single day. I'm not going to give them any less. So I was like, okay, let me start taking the classes now to become um, an agent because I feel like this is probably my way out, right? I know there is an issue to solve out there. I know people need information. People need me to be there with them. So I'm going to take the leap of faith and then just jump. I started to do some research that day. And my wife told me, you need to complete 90 hours of classes. I'm like, oh, I said, 90? That's it? She was like, how do you, why do you mean that's it? I said, it's 90 hours, right? We have 24 hours in a day, which means if I study for 10 hours a day, I only need nine days. She said, are you insane? I said, no, but we got 24 hours in a day. So it's simple, right? 10 hours a day for nine days, it's 90. So the same day, I went online, I started to do some research because I was like, okay, if I pass my license, then what? What's the next step? I need to end my license somewhere. So I started to, um, to do some research. I started to engage with different agents around here, um, but no one could really give me like, a specific answer to how I could go from being licensed to building my business to actually funding um, the success I wanted. I did not want anyone to, I mean, to drag me by the hand and then hand me something. No, I know how to work, right? Uh, working hard is not something that I like. I work hard. I just wanted someone to show me the way, to explain to me, okay, you, you get your license, you do this, you do that, then you'll be fine. Then I came across uh, Sean's page. I looked him up. I was like, okay, this guy is cool. He knows exactly what he's talking about. Let me reach out to him. So I texted both of them, talk, uh, Sean and Scott. So I was like, okay, the first one to respond to me, I'm going to engage the conversation. So I texted them within an hour. They responded back to me. So we started talking, talking. That was um, March 14, last year. So we started talking, 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 talking. I was like, okay, dang, I got the information I need. And uh, they were so open to me. They gave me all the answer. I needed, they didn't make me feel like I was like someone just disturbing them or whatever. I told him, okay, you give me three weeks, I'll come back to you with the license. He said, bad. So the same day I did register for the classes, um, called my boss and said, yo, do you know the two weeks vacation you refused to give me last year? I'm taking it now. And he was like, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to uh, you have to bid for it. I said, no, I did not take my vacation last year. I did not take my vacation the year before. I did not take my vacation the year before the year before. And I did not take my vacation for the last five years. And I'm a classic. I have over 400 hours um, sick time. You can, you, can, you can either pay me a vacation or I'm going to use my sick time. You choose, right? I even have four personal dates. 
I could use. So either way, like whatever you, however you want to do it, it's on you. But I'm just telling you, I am not showing up to work for the next two weeks. You need something, I'll be here to help you, right? I'm going to be responding to my emails. I'm going to be supporting my team from home. But as far as me being physically present, I'm not going to be there. He said, okay, could you just come tomorrow then to show your supervisors exactly what needs to be done for the next two weeks? I said, yeah, fine. So I went there. I did explain to my 12 supervisors um, what needed to be done. So I basically had to spread my workload across 12 people because no one could do it alone. And I was supportive to them, even at home. So I came home, I locked myself in my office for the next two weeks from sun up to sundown. I was going through my classes, going through my materials. I shut up my phone, I never watched TV, I never did anything by studying, right? Study, I study, I study. After about um, 11 days, I did complete the 90 hours. Then I had to schedule my exam, which was about um, a week away, like 10 days away. So I had to wait and I was impatient, right? I had to wait, I had to wait, I had to wait, I had to wait. Then they pushed it to April 14th, exactly 12 months from now. And that same day, my favorite team was playing at noon. And football is a big thing to me, right? I love football. You guys call it soccer, bro. It's, uh, it's football to me. I love football. And my team was playing the Champions League semi-final at noon. And my exam was at 10. But the exam was in Bellevue, which is 30 minutes from my house. So I was like, okay, no matter what, I have to finish this exam by 11.30. I don't care if they give me three hours or four hours. I, have to, I cannot miss the game, right? So I went to that exam room. I was fully prepared. I knew I had, I'm going to pass the exam. I knew I'm going to get it 100%. There was no doubt about it. The preparation I did, um, the time I was committed to actually prep myself, I knew I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it. So I did my exam like an hour and twenty minutes. I finished. I rushed to the room. I was, I even forgot to get my result because I was just wanted to get to my car to get home to watch the game. Then the lady was like, "Oh, you need this." I said, "What's that?" "Oh, your confirmation. You passed the exam." I said, "Okay, fine." So I got home. I watched the game. Then after the game, I called Sean, I said, yo, I got my license. So now what? That's how everything got started. That's crazy, man. That's like the most absolutely insane story just to see where you've come from. And, and I think, again, that's going to protrude through a lot of what we'll kind of dive into here quickly about, you know, what you've been able to succeed with in your first year. And, you know, I think it's a testament to your work ethic, your mindset and, and the grit that you've built and the mental fortitude over the years of just always being up against something and always being able to push through it no matter what right. and I, I think you know you've got a very similar response to me where every time I, i'm up against something i always say i'll figure it out like i don't know how right. but i'll figure it out and i think when you yeah. have uh -huh. that mindset you know you're, you're always going to figure it out so you know right. you for anybody that's that's not familiar you know herb's talking about sean and scott batista who are the luxury agents out of out of seattle who are now your business partners you know you right. it's been a year since you've been licensed and i yeah. think it's really incredible to talk about what you did within that first year to build momentum because you know facebook has been a huge part of of your business but you've also you know got some pretty crazy stores of doing whatever it takes to get lock boxes open so you know let's right. start with facebook and look at you know how did somebody build such massive momentum to the point where you're now having you know eighty thousand dollar months in real estate from somebody that you know just got their license within a two-week window so what was that journey like for you to actually build momentum as somebody that is not familiar with the business yeah so basically to me it was like when i got into real estate i knew this was now my number one job right i wasn't just kind of interested in real estate because some people are kind of interested in real estate when they get into the business they are just interested which means they do things when it's, it's convenient to them but for me, I had to be committed. I knew I had a family to feed. I knew I had no other option. When I walked out of my six-figure job, I had no backup plan, right? This was my plan, right? I had to make it work. And for me to actually make it work, I had to get out of my comfort zone, which uh, led me to, 
to Facebook, right? Yeah. Before we lost it, I never really posted anything on, on Facebook, maybe like a couple of pictures, uh, because I've never really felt comfortable um, in my shoes to really show myself out there and then um, just, just be social. But getting into real estate, I had to make it work. And uh, Facebook is huge. Everyone uses Facebook, right? From like a 90 year old grandmother to like 11 year old, like a uh, student in high school, like everyone is on Facebook, right? So I was like, okay, how could I leverage my Facebook to drive my business? And uh, I wanted to start a Facebook page at first. I was like, okay, let me separate from this to that. But then one day I was like, what if I just show people exactly who I am, right? For me to build up my business, first I need to build up my sphere, right? I need to let my sphere know that I am into real estate, show them who I am, show them I am in the business, and then show them what value I could actually provide. Yes, I'm going to have a Facebook page, but I'm going to utilize my personal Facebook page because I don't want people to see me just a businessman, right? I want them to see me as me right to get to know who i am to get to know what i can do and what i can provide so i just started to first i customized um, my facebook because i never had a, uh, a profile picture in the past so i had to get like a nice headshot and then do all crazy things optimize my bio so that when people come to my page they know exactly what i do without even me telling them so i just started posting like every single day but also adding new people because I had about three or 400 people only at the time. So I had to really grow my network. So I was like, okay, every single day, I'm gonna discipline myself. Am I gonna add 10 people in the morning and 10 people at night before I go to bed, regardless of who you are, right? But if, as long as you live in Washington state, I'm not gonna add you. Why? Because if you're in Washington state, whether or not you are ready to buy a house right now, you may know someone who does right or the day you are going to like something of my on my on my own my post or whatever like comment share your sphere will also see that and that sphere may have someone who's willing to buy so i was just committed every single day posting on social media and then when someone responds to me i'm gonna just send them like a thank you message thank you for um, for adding me and then if they respond back then i'm gonna engage the conversation if they don't, I'm going to let it go. So I just started doing it. It's hard work. Like, mm -hmm. it takes time, right? When you have like 100 people responding in one day and you have to send messages every single one of them, it takes time. So, but I had to do what I had to do. That's how I really built up my momentum. But I was also sharing tips um, for first time home buyers um, what to do to, to become a first time home buyer? What are the criteria? Um, how do you improve this? Like credit score, for example. Do you need a down payment to buy a house? Or if you don't need a down payment, what are your options? And all these things. I just started to to share um, with people and people just started to engage with me. So I wasn't afraid to show uh, what I was doing or who I was. I did embrace it. I got out of my comfort zone. And that's how I got uh, basically 80 percent of my business last year from facebook that's without wild, man. paying any leads at all that's it's so powerful because i think again you know i talk to a lot of people and they're they're almost fearful to let people know that they're a realtor like they don't even want to announce right. that they got into the industry and but then they uh, but then on the other hand they talk about struggling to get business but nobody knows who they are and i think you know you've taken that right. incredible approach of just saying hey i want everybody to know who i am because if you don't want to continue to follow me or or be friends or whatever well that's fine because then you're not my ideal client like you're not who i'm going for right. and just making exactly. sure that you've got that presence is is so powerful now you've got a really cool kind of story if you will about uh, open houses and I think this is going to be uh, something that is going to really resonate with a lot of people about the fact that you were doing open houses for a certain window of time and maybe you can dive into you know how you were getting those open houses but then you made one specific shift and that started to gain right. traction momentum from that so maybe break that down for everybody yeah so once yeah when I got into real estate so the things that really drove me into real estate at, at first was I wanted to help people, right? I wanted to basically help people like myself who didn't have any clue when buying real estate. I was like, okay, I need to help them people to find value or whatever. 
and then help them be ready to, to buy real estate. But once I got my license, I kind of shifted away from um, from that. I started to also open houses every. I did open house every single weekend since last April. I never missed any weekend, right? But at the time, I was basically focused on like multi-million dollar um, listing. I was doing like a three point five million dollar open house, and then you would only have like six people that showed up, and then three noisy neighbors, and then the other three people that didn't even talk to you, right? I did that for a while and I never really got any, any result. I was showing up. I was showing up every single day. I never missed any weekend. Um, I got to a point where I had to really call Scott, my mentor. And I said, yo, I need to see you. Then uh, we met. I said, I'm doing everything right, but I'm not getting any, any results. What am I actually um, doing wrong, right? I show up every weekend. I never make any, any excuse. Whether it's raining, snowing, whatever, I'm there. I'm doing it, right? And then it was, okay, we need to dive into your stats first. Show me your data, right? How many deals did you close? What is your average sale, right? And then what, what are the areas these deals are coming from? Then I showed him and then he was, okay, your average sale is 550 for now. So what in the world are you even doing those million dollar listings? I said, um, they are beautiful. People love nice houses, right? He said, yeah, but you need to make money, right? And you need to basically provide value. Like, I was like, okay, dang, that's, that's impressive. So I went home that day. I started to study my own data and I was like, okay. I want to provide value to people, right? But value in self means nothing. Value is value only if the marketplace values what you are providing. Mm -hmm. And the $3 million listing, I don't have nothing to provide to these people. They are probably, probably millionaires already. They are making like over yeah. six figures a year. I got no value to add to these people at this point in my career, right? But the people who are actually buying those 500, 550, 600 uh, thousand houses, they need me. They need my information. They need my expertise, right? They need me to guide them through the process, which means they value what I have to provide. In that case, I am valuable now, right? So I shifted from doing a multi-million dollar listing to basically doing under 800 because that's where my clientele were, right? And then I also shifted from going all the way up north to basically focusing on the main area that my business are coming from. Like 80% of my business are coming from um, Tacoma, Pialup area and Federal Way. These are the areas I want to really focus on and like just dive into the And I've been doing it since and the results have been pretty, pretty impressive. So we are already four months into the year. Um, I've closed on 12 transactions so far. And four of them, they came straight from open houses. I had people that worked in my open houses, wanting, ready to buy a house, and didn't have any clue on how to, to buy it. So I even had a lady that came to my open house. She was the only person that showed up that day. It was winter time, really cold. And like reception at the house was so bad, I could even use my phone. So I was really, I was boring, right? And I did on the Friday night, mm -hmm. like 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And she was the only person that showed up at the open house. She walked in, she loved the house. It was a new construction. But she was like, in my family, nobody has ever owned a house. And do you think I even stand a chance to buy this one? I said, of course you do. Let's uh, let's talk about your, your situation. So we did start uh, talking about a situation and she makes well over six figures, but she didn't even know how to buy a house just because she, they never owned a house in the past. So mm -hmm. for her, buying a house, you have to be, you have to have millions in the bank or you have to pay in cash or you have to come up with 20% down payment. And uh, I, ha I had to explain to her, you could get this specific house for only 3.5% down if you want to, or you could even go down the route of the down payment assistance program, whatever makes you feel comfortable. But definitely with your income, your um, credit score, your debt to income ratio, you will be more than qualified to buy a house. Let me connect with my lender to see uh, what are your options. And then we will talk about the numbers afterwards. So the same day, 
I sent an email to my lender. They did connect. She was even, she was really fast at applying. She did apply the same night, sent documents. The next day she got approved for even more than the house was actually um, selling for. We made an offer. Yeah, I was accepted, right? And two months back, I had a guy that worked in my open house with the pre-approval letter. He came in, he ended me the pre-approval letter. He was like, could you please make an offer for me on this house? I said, hell yeah, I'll do it. So shifting from those million dollar listing to basically focusing on where my value actually was needed, that when actually uh, like scale my business when it comes to open houses. But I also engage a lot when I'm doing open houses and uh, I try to get people to talk to me. I ask open-handed questions, the questions that would push people to actually give me like a sentence as an answer versus just saying yes or no, right? I would ask them, oh, what do you think about this property, for example? Versus, do you like this property, right? These kind of questions help people to be open up, to understand, because if you need, I mean, if you know exactly what someone is looking for, why they are interested in this particular location or this particular type of property, you would be having a better idea on where to serve them better and how to help them out. So that have been um, how I was doing it. And then it's been successful so far. That's incredible, man. It goes back to the concept that we talk about all the time is what gets measured gets managed. And, you know, the fact that you knew your numbers is so powerful because you can't make a calculated decision on how to improve anything if you don't have the data. And right. you know, I think the fact that you were able to make those adjustments is a testament to, you know, you actually keeping in tune with how your business is going and, and what can be done in order to improve it. Now, you know, mindset's a big thing for you. And I think, you know, yeah. your story about the lockbox is something that I think is really powerful because I'd love for us to kind of pull this full circle with, you know, your opinion on the mindset that people need in order to succeed as a new agent, because there's many people that get into real estate, they don't have a sphere, they don't have much money, but they don't really also have the mindset where they're too casual about it. And I think that goes back to, right. you know, your your concept of being interested versus being committed. And a lot of people are just interested in casual and right. they're not really willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So you want to quickly share that with people about, you know, that journey of that lockbox story and, and kind of your, I guess, best piece of advice for somebody that's just getting started or maybe has been in real estate but hasn't built momentum yet. Right. So when I got licensed, that was basically um, April 14, but I was fully uh, engaged with EXP May 1st. That's when my license was accepted with EXP May 1st. But when I was actually taking my classes, I did I did take it like a different approach. So I was taking my classes, but then at the same time, I was also talking to people I knew, like at work, my employees, or my coworkers, and uh, everyone I could talk to, to tell them, okay, yo, I am in real estate, right? And then when they would ask me, oh, I, you, already, you already have your license? I said, no, I'm taking my classes. But in three or four weeks, I guarantee you I'm going to be in real estate. So I started to build the list of people who were kind of interested into buying a house. But I didn't want to push the conversation further along because I knew if they got to a point where they want to apply now and then search for a home, I wouldn't be able to help them. So I was like, okay, you guys wait three weeks, four weeks, I'll be licensed. Then we can um, start the process. So I got licensed and my first client was ready. He was ready to rock and roll. I didn't even know um, like how to start. I didn't even have any loan officer, right? I had to call Sean, yo, bro, I have um, this client here. He needs to apply for a house. How do we do it? Then he sent me um, the loan officer contact information. I did connect them. They got approved pretty fast. But what I didn't know was there is MLX key box. Like, at listings right and in order for you to get into the house you have to somehow be able to open it and in my mind i was like okay once i get my license i'm gonna be licensed right if i go to the house the house will be open for me they will leave the key somewhere i would just call the listing agent and blah 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 so i got licensed on the friday i got licensed on may 1st and then a few days later that was it. on the friday we had to see a house they sent me a house on thursday they were like oh can we see this house tomorrow? I said, yeah, we can. What time? 6 p.m. Okay, bet. 6 p.m. I did uh, schedule the showing, blah, blah, blah. And in the morning, I started to ask myself questions. Okay, now what? How am I going to open the door? I don't want to be embarrassed, right? Let me 
um let me call sean i call sean and then he said oh bro you have to actually uh, have your key your e key activated you just give them a call they'll create an account for you and then your key will be activated be good to go i call him up i did set up the account i paid the fees but it was friday and then the lady said your account will be activated the next business day which was on uh, monday i said yeah but am i gonna be able to use it today she said no the next business day I said, okay, fine. Then I called Sean. I said, yo, I have no key. Um, and my clients, they have to see the house today. He said, fine, let me find someone who's in the area who may be able to, to help you out. So he texted in the group. We have a group chat. He texted in the group if someone was uh, in the area at 6 p.m. to help me open the house. People were also busy. It was summertime. Like every agent was really busy at the time. And um, I started receiving phone calls from my colleagues. Oh, yo, I would, I would love to help you out, man. But I'm going to be like an hour away from there. Just good luck. I think you you figure it out. Like many people call me. I was like, dang, Sean. Then 3 p.m. comes, 4 p.m. comes. I was still on the phone with Sean constantly. He said, man, you have to maybe reschedule it because there is no way. I'm going to be like two hours away from there. I cannot even come to to open it for you. So I sat there at 4 p.m. I had two options, right? I had to either call my clients to tell them we have to reschedule, which was a huge risk for me because we didn't really build like a strong bond to where they could trust me. And they knew I'm a new agent, right? And the minute I tell them I can open the house, they'll be like, you're a rookie. Let me go to the next guy, the expert, right? And I, I didn't have a luxury to take that risk which took me to my second option, I had to show up regardless. I did not know how I was going to open that door. I just knew I had to do my part, right? And I truly believe my entire life, as long as I wake up every single day, I do what I have to do without making any excuse. Everything will unfold, no matter what it is. The how to part of it sometimes, it's none of my business. What I have to do, focus on my part. What I have to do. And what I had to do that day was get in my car, drive to Tacoma, and get to the house. That's what I had to do that day. And the how to part of it was none of my business, right? So I called him. I said, yo, I am going. And I told my wife, I'm going to open the house. I have no key. I'm going to open the house. So Sean was like, bro, you do what you have to do. So I got there. And uh, driving to Tacoma, I was listening to uh, one of Steve Harvey's speech, You Have Not Cause You Ask Not. And I've listened to that speech maybe like, like thousands of times. And I was listening to that. And I got there about an hour early. I was in my car sitting, thinking of what I am going to tell them when they get here. Because they already texted me, they're coming. So I was like, okay, let's see, let's see. And uh, I told God, God, I'm here. Now it's on you. If you want to embarrass me today, you got your chance, right? But I did what I had to do. I didn't make any excuse, right? I did not take any shortcut. I, I worked hard. I got these clients super hard and um, got them qualified. And this is my deal. And like, now it's on you. If you want to embarrass me, do it. Then... At 5.20, there is this agent, Kelly Williams, that came. And then I saw them going into the house. They did their thing. And then uh, he finished around 5.30, 5.35. And then when he was actually locking the door, I got out of my car. I approached him. I told him exactly what happened. I told him the truth. I told him about my story. At first, he laughed at me. And then uh, he was like, bro, it's a teamwork. Um, I wait for your clients. Let's do this. So my clients got there, we did um, tour the house. Ne they never made any, op any offer on the house, by the way. We did end up making an offer in the house uh, the, next, uh, the next week. But I was relieved when I got into my car, I was so proud of myself. Why? Not because I showed the house, but because I did not let my struggle or my challenge or whatever I saw as an obstacle stopping me from doing what I had to do right um i had to take control of what i could control and the rest 
just leave it up to to god right so i showed up i took action and then i got the results so that's what actually um stopped more, most people sometimes not getting what you want to get could affect the entire life or the entire career that's why you have to um to know your why and when you know you know exactly your why that why we push you every single day to take action regardless of um anything no excuse just action do your parts and then the result will follow yeah that's it's insane just and again i think it's it's a testament and commitment to your character that that you're not going to let something weigh you down and, and i think a lot of people you know look for the easy opportunity and the easy option of i can just reschedule it to monday i can you know it's all good but they don't right. think about the fact that you know that level of discipline is what carries you through the momentum that you've built so you know when when it comes to mindset somebody that's again either just getting into real estate or maybe they had a terrible first year and they want to build momentum you know what's kind of your best piece of advice for somebody that you know wants to build what you've built and and you know is we know that there's going to be struggles we know there's going to be obstacles it's inevitable in this journey so what's kind of your your you know recommendations for somebody to push through these types of things yeah i mean most people they give up so early when they don't get the result they want but you have to first know exactly what it is you want to accomplish right you have to set milestones right um for example, many people will be like, okay, I want to basically, I want to close 20 days in 2023, but how are you going to actually do it? How does it look like on a quarterly? Um, I mean, I break, I break my, my goals and my, my dreams in small pieces, right? Last year I was working on my business plan with my, uh, my mentors or Sean. I set up my business plan and he asked me, what do you need to accomplish next year? I told him, okay, I want to sell uh, 40 plus houses. Then he said, how does it look like every quarter? I said, okay, uh, maybe 10. Okay, every month, how many do you have to close? I said, three. Then every week, how do you have to close? I said, one. So now every day, what do you need to do to get to that one thing, right? That's what most people actually like. They are not really organized and they are not really structured. They have a bigger picture on what they need to accomplish. Maybe 10 mil in production, maybe five mil in production, maybe 20 mil in production. That's good. You already know your number, but then what do you need to do every single day to differentiate yourself from that those who actually want it and those who actually go get it right break down your goals in small pieces because in africa there is um a say that says if you want to eat an elephant you don't eat the elephant at one bite right you go one bite at a piece until one day the entire elephant will be actually gone so break your goals in small pieces know exactly what you need to accomplish every quarter every month every week and then what you need to do on a daily basis to actually get there and always review whatever you are doing if you are trying something that's not working for about two or three months there is chances probably you are doing something wrong or maybe you are focusing on the wrong thing review what you have done see exactly the process it is the process that is wrong it is your approach that is wrong it is the system you are using that is wrong try to find exactly what it is it's not working and then make adjustment and also, don't be afraid to ask, right? I've seen many people, even in my own group here, they are afraid to ask questions. If you call Scott and Sean, they will tell you how many times I call them like 11 p.m. to ask a silly question. Because to me, I only know what I know, right? Something I don't know, I'm not going to be afraid to ask someone that does. I never knew how to make a business card. And Amanda, she is the one who actually showed me how to make a business card. I had to bother her. I had to go into her DM. Yo, how did you make your business card, right? These are the small things that separate most people. They are afraid to ask questions and to ask for help when they need it the most. Because maybe of the ego or because they just don't know the value of um, someone else could provide. But to me, you have to be structured. You have to be organized. You have to constantly study whatever you are doing on a daily basis and then ask for help when you need it. 
Definitely, man. You know, by failing to plan, you're planning to fail. And I think a lot of people, again, being too casual about it, they just throw out this fictitious number that they want to hit. And and with no kind of plan of action, it's never going to come to fruition because, you 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 know, it's the right. daily activities, as you allude to, that, that work toward that. And I think, you know, people overcomplicate real estate and they try and find the next shiny penny. But what you'll see, like, and you've you know, been the exact example of this is just by doing the simple things repeatedly and consistently over time, that result starts to come. And I think, you know, right. your whole journey has just been incredible. So, you know, as we start to pull this full circle, we always like to, you know, end this with, you know, why you decided to partner with eXp and also people now have an opportunity to partner with you as well. So, you know, first, why did you decide to come this way? But secondly, what does it look like for somebody that gets the luxury of being able to partner with you and get your support in their journey? Yeah, so at first, uh, when I was starting my classes, as I said, I was talking to like different people out there from different brokerages, right? To me, leaving my 9 to 5 first to get into real estate, I wasn't looking for uh, like someone to be my boss or someone to watch over me every single day to tell me what I need to do, what I have to do. I wanted a place where I, I would be seen as a partner versus like an employee, right? And when I was talking to different people, um, like the way they structure the business, I did not see how I could actually grow my business in that way. I didn't want to go to the office every single day. I didn't want to pay for a desk fee. I did not um, have to pay for coaching and, and pay for mentors. I did, not, I did not want that, right? You don't show me how to work hard. I know how to work hard. Show me how I could grow my business. Show me how to help people. Show me how to actually have um, production. That's what I that's what I wanted. And um, EXP gave me this opportunity to where I am pretty much my own boss and my mentors, they are not my bosses, they are my partners, right? We see each other as equal as opposed to me reporting to them, right? And the support I have, the mentorship I have, the coaching I have, the guidance I have, if it wasn't for my mentors, I wouldn't be able to, to get the success I have right now, right? I work hard, I have the drive, but that wasn't enough to get me to where I'm at right now. I had to constantly ask questions. I had to constantly ask support from my mentors. I called Sean and Scott like many times 11 p.m. to ask them how to do this, how to do that, how I could improve this. And even shifting my mindset from of having results in open houses. If I didn't have the conversation with my mentor, if he wasn't even open to teach me those things, to actually help me understand my data, I wouldn't be able to make that shift, right? Just the support, the coaching, the mentorship that I have from my team has been really, really um, incredible. And then adding that with my drive and my work ethic, nothing could stop me from there. That's awesome, man. And, and you know, people have the opportunity to partner with you. So, you know, what does that look like in, in terms of, you know, now being able to align with you, myself, Sean and Scott, you know, um, I think there's going to be a lot of agents, especially over the next couple of years that, you know, don't have the support, don't have the training, don't have the right. tools and, and are struggling and are looking for that collaborative community and partnership to help them get to that next level. So, you know, what does that look like when people get to reach out to you and, and talk about becoming your partner? Yeah, so basically, uh, my story is there, right? I have a proof of concept. I was I was the guy who partnered with uh, two mentors. They showed me the way. I did apply whatever I had to apply. I have to learn a lot. So I have that experience and then that knowledge that I could actually pass it on to them, right? So when they join me, the mentorship is there. The coaching is there. The support is there, not only from me, but from the entire team as well. They, they will have access to my mentors as well. They will have access to you when needed. So basically the support is there and then like the book, I mean, um, the footprint is there for them to become successful and then we will be there along the way. Personally, I'm going to be training them, showing them a way of doing things to help them become successful and also being able to hold them accountable for the things they should be doing because that's also what most people actually um, lack. So accountability and then support and help is what, what is needed.
I love it, man. Well, again, I, I couldn't be more impressed and inspired by your journey. And I think a lot of people are, are going to feel the same way after listening to this. And it's going to be Thank incredible to, yeah. to just see, you know, now that you've pulled your full year, first year full circle, what things look like going forward. So um, again, just wanted to say a huge thank you for coming on today, brother, sharing your story. Thank it's you. incredible. Your role model is so many. And uh, again, guys, I'm going to make sure to link all of uh, everybody's contact information below all of his profiles so you can take a peek and follow his incredible journey and reach out to become his partner. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. We'll be in touch, guys. Take care.